So uh, I'm now dealing with the um, urgency motion. So I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 16 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the, leader, uh, that the letter from Senator Wong proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 16 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Uh, yes, I believe it is. Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall now ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Marielle Smith. Deputy President, I rise in support of the urgency motion moved by my colleague Senator Wong, and urgent it is. Deputy President, you don't put your hand up for public life unless you believe that when you get to a place like this, when you take a seat in a chamber like this, that your voice will matter, that your words will matter, that they will have influence, that they will have meaning, that they will have impact, that you can use those words to help lead our nation, to help lead your communities, to be a leader to influence, to engage. And Deputy President, I, I truly believe that most people who put their hand up for a seat in this chamber or in the other place are trying to use their voice for good, who believe in the impact of their words, who believe in the impact that their words can have. But the mo at, the moment, at the moment, in this place and in the other place, too many of our fellow senators aren't using their voice to lead, aren't using their influence to lead, but are undermining leadership, undermining what it means to be a good leader. We're at a point of time in our history where reliable information matters more than ever, where science matters more than ever, and where, when you undermine science, you undermine good information, you undermine information which will keep people safe, which will keep them healthy, which could actually keep them alive, when you undermine that information, when you undermine that science, you put people at risk. And we must call it out. We must call it out in this chamber. We must call it out in public. We must use our voices to do that, to call out those who are seeking to undermine our response to this pandemic, to frighten, to incite fear, to spread misinformation. No one wanted this pandemic. No one was prepared for the devastation and destruction and it has caused, not just in Australia, but around our world. Around our world, the millions of lives lost. The families devastated, communities devastated, nations devastated, lives destroyed, livelihoods destroyed. And for too long, we were completely vulnerable to the devastation the pandemic was caused. But then entered science, then entered the incredible men and women who worked tirelessly around the clock to deliver a vaccine. And how lucky are we? How lucky are we to have science? How lucky are we to be the beneficiaries of their work? And notwithstanding the government's sloppy delivery of the vaccine rollout, how lucky are we now? to have more ready access to a vaccine, which might just be the thing which saves our lives, which might just be the thing that protects our neighbour, that keeps our children safe. And to be able to do that, to be able to keep the people we love safe, that's a blessing and it's a miracle of science and I am so grateful for it. I am double vaccinated. I am gratefully double vaccinated. Just like 77 per cent of my fellow South Australians aged over 16 who rolled up their sleeves as well to get vaccinated, to keep our community safe. Mr. D sorry, Deputy President, I put my hand up for public life to use my voice to lead in my community, to serve my community. But there are people in this place who are using their voice to spread toxic fear and misinformation, which puts their fellow Australians at risk. Encouraging misinformation that can turn to vaccine hesitancy. And we need to call it out. And not just those who are engaged in the explicit peddling 
of misinformation and disinformation who are explicitly doing this to their fellow Australians, explicitly undermining our response to this pandemic, but those who are also dog-whistling, playing in word semantics, which seek to undermine this rollout, which seek to undermine our response. The consequences of this misinformation are real and they are personal. When they encourage vaccine hesitancy, when they create fear, they risk the health and well-being of not just individuals but communities. The consequences are real for the small business owners in my community who are already confused and stressed out about how to protect their staff, their customers and their clients, who think they know where their Prime Minister stands when he legitimises vaccine mandates on the one hand and then quietly, softly undermines them with the other. And they're real for those of us in this place for whom misinformation, disinformation is hitting close to home. They were real and personal for me when I found out that my vaccinated 102-year-old grandfather was having people not turn up to visit him because they thought the fact that he was vaccinated meant that they could catch COVID. He's 102 and he missed out on those visits because of that fear. It's absurd, but it's happening. It's happening because people let the misinformation happen, that they peddle it and encourage it, they stoke it. It's happening because misinformation has become a business model an electoral model, and it is putting Australians at risk. Deputy President, my state of South Australia, we're about to open up. And whilst there is much to welcome in that, and I trust that those decisions have been taken on health advice, as we trust that the decisions throughout this pandemic are taken on health advice, and when they are, we support them. But I have to say I am deeply concerned for parts of my community who are at most risk, who potentially have the most to lose when and if COVID returns to our state. Populations like our First Nations South Australians, for whom the double vaccination rate is just 46.7 per cent, dramatically lower than our whole of eligible population. And you know we have seen particularly dangerous, particularly toxic spread of misinformation amongst our First Nations populations. And that, combined with a vacuum of appropriate public health messaging, has left people at risk. I want to commend my fellow senators, Senator Dodson and McCarthy, also Linda Burney and all of those who have stepped up to call out this misinformation, have stepped up to keep these communities safe in the context of this fear-mongering. Because we have seen what happens when communities with significant First Nations populations become the site of a COVID-19 outbreak. We saw what happened in Wilcannia. Nothing short of a public health crisis. But we have these low rates in other parts of our country as well. We have them in South Australia. And it's not the fault of local populations. There were significant issues in terms of the rollout, in terms of the support provided to these communities, in terms of the public information and messaging but they need our support now, and I'm worried. I'm also worried about the kids in our community who can't yet get a vaccination. I'm a mother of two children under the age of five. And so when this misinformation spreads through our community, when vaccine hesitancy spreads throughout our community, it puts kids at risk too. It puts those who can't get a vaccine at risk. This is, this is dangerous stuff. This is not coming to this place, to this building, using your voice to do good. It's not coming here to lead in our communities, to support your fellow South Australians. It's not coming here to stand up and say, hey, thank God for the miracle of science. Thank God for this blessing. Thank God we're not on the front line of this war in this pandemic alone now, without any armour. Thank God for science and scientists who have given us this vaccine, who have given us an opportunity to be safer. Millions of people have died worldwide. And I know there are countless people around the world who would love to have access to a vaccine and who can't. And here we do. Here we have this armour. So let's listen to the scientists. Let's listen to science. Let's value and appreciate this miracle and call out the people here and the people around our country who are using 
uncertainty and fear, turning it into a business model, turning it into an electoral model, saying, here's my shot of re-election, I'll stoke this fear, I'll stoke this fire, instead of leading, instead of leading their communities, instead of doing everything they can to uphold the health advice, to uphold science and scientists, to uphold the yama we now have in this war, in this pandemic. Call them out. It is grossly irresponsible. And it's not a game. It's not a game. It's not student politics. This is real, real lives, real communities, my community, our kids, our First Nations populations, our vulnerable populations who deserve so much more, who deserve leaders, who deserve people worthy of the chairs that they take up in this place. It's time to call them out. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Hughes. Deputy President, and I guess 2021, we shouldn't be surprised that we're starting these final two sitting weeks this year in sort of a bit of a challenging environment, as we've experienced for most of the past 20 months or so. So we probably all shouldn't be too overly surprised, but I do think uh, this week we may be reaching a new level of the bazaar. After question time today, I, I feel Senator Wong may actually need to sit down with her own Senate team and ascertain where they actually are on vaccines. We had Senator O'Neill criticising no jab, no play, like the best of the anti-vaxxers, clearly wanting to open our children to a virus that we're more than capable of vaccinating against. But she was then followed by Senator McAllister, who was critical that the PM had suggested people in Brisbane should be able to get a coffee at 80 per cent vax rate, putting baristas at risk, smacking of demands for mandatory vaccination. And then, of course, we saw the bill this morning by Senator Hanson attempting to fundamentally halt government legislation. Seriously? What sort of ejaculation of the pacifier is this? I would hope that one thing we can all agree on is national security, the importance of keeping our nation safe. But yet, here we are, faced with a revolt as we see a bill that will boost our national security, secure critical infrastructure to prevent cyber attacks, and this is the first piece of legislation that's come before us today. So I stand here in disappointment that our national security, all of our security, might be jeopardised due to this sort of behaviour. So when we began the COVID journey, National Cabinet was established to ensure that the whole country was working in the same direction when it came to living in a post-pandemic world. A national plan was developed, working with expert advice from the Doherty Institute and Commonwealth Treasury. The Morrison government has always been and continues to be committed to the national plan. And that plan is working where it is upheld. Thresholds were set. Jurisdictions could open safely both at the 70 per cent and the 80 per cent fully vaccinated marks. Now, I appreciate we've seen some states adhere to the plan and others go a little rogue. And if I was looking cynically at the behaviour of Senator Hanson's home state premier along with WA's, you may think they could be working in cahoots to cause political problems for the Prime Minister in the lead-up to the federal election. And this is important for everyone to remember. It's the state premiers, far too often along with unelected health officers, determining these restrictions. And to anyone who looks across the different states, for anyone who assumes that some of these restrictions are based in science is ludicrous. Arbitrary numbers in homes allowed, random distances people can travel, masks both inside and out, let alone by yourself in a car, drinking, sitting down versus standing up. But what we do know, despite what the COVID doomsayers predicted, when New South Wales opened it up at its high level of vaccination, cases have continued to decline. Perhaps more importantly, hospitalisations and those requiring ventilators those numbers have also consistently dropped. This is important to remember because despite the voodoo science, the sheep drench pushes, we are seeing vaccinations at work. They are effective at ensuring the virus's minimum health impacts. They're keeping people safe. As we see those who are vaccinated, even if they are COVID positive, they're not really getting as sick, nor are they passing on as widely as their viral load is much lower. So high vaccination rates combined with sensible public health strategies, we're seeing a virus we can learn to live with, not one that's incredibly deadly for many Australians. 
Now, I do understand that everyone in the Australian population pretty much across the board is over it. They want government out of their life. They want things to get back to normal. I actually think we would struggle to find too many people who would want us to continue living in the same way that we have been. We all want to see kids back in the classroom, our teenagers and young people to experience all we did when we were young, for families to be able to get together, for businesses to be able to operate as they best see fit. And in fact, as of yesterday, every single state has reached over 80 per cent first dose, and in fact all are over 70 per cent fully vaxxed. So it is time for restrictions to be rolled back. And this is something every Premier has agreed to in National Cabinet. All of them unanimously agreed to in National Cabinet. The performance art that's being conducted by some state premiers clinging to relevance, or even more concerning, those with hospital systems already overwhelmed without a COVID case at all, are now working actively against the plan they agreed to. But we do also need to remember that at no point has the Morrison government mandated vaccines. We've always said that it's up to the individual. And whilst we've never hidden our desire to see as many Australians as possible to get vaccinated, we've never demanded they be compulsory across the board. There are, of course, exceptions, those in certain aged care and health settings, but this also is not anything new. This is something that has occurred previously around the flu vaccine. And we want to protect and continue to protect those vulnerable communities and keep those and those that work with them safe. And I think, as Senator Lambie actually so perfectly put it together this morning, mandatory flu vaccines have been around since COVID was nothing but a sparkle in a bat's eye. The ability to mandate is driven by states. And while some states, such as my home state as New South Wales, has set a date where those who have decided against the vaccine will open up to them, it still will be only around 4 to 5 per cent of people over 16, a very small majority of people, who will not have received a first or second dose of vaccine. So once you get there to 15th of December for us, you will be free to do as you wish. And on top of that, those that have decided to remain unvaccinated will be able to access, should they require a health system funded by all taxpayers, should they require hospitalisation or a ventilator. We need to learn to live with COVID. It should be something similar to the flu, and it's the vaccines that can allow this to occur. So at that point, 95 per cent fully vaccinated, I do think we should also see the end of QR codes and mask mandates. We need to return to a pre-COVID life. Freedom should be returned without any restrictions. But many of these restrictions are being put in place under state health orders. And I note that some of the people who supported the bill this morning were also some of the strongest advocates in this place for states' rights and keen to ensure respect of the Constitution. Yet seemingly some were happy to overrule, override and, quite frankly, overreach across the states. So it's important to remember, for those in Queensland and WA in particular, elections have consequences. The overwhelming support given to both premiers in those states at recent elections has emboldened them to maintain unacceptable levels of restrictions not based on science, effective health advice, quite frankly, not even common sense. But the rest of the country should not be put at risk with this unacceptable behaviour and threats because a small percentage of the population can't get a coffee. As we've all come to know far too well, states and territories have a large degree of autonomy to conduct their own affairs under the Australian Constitution, the ability to implement public orders amongst them. There has been significant overreach by premiers, and I'm not denying that at all. I think the restriction of movement throughout this country has been extended beyond belief. I think it's a little crazy, in fact, that we're all sitting here, set up in split seats, mask mandates in Canberra, the most highly vaccinated jurisdiction in the country, in fact, one of almost in the world. I do think businesses should have the right to refuse entry or service to those who decide to remain unvaccinated, not those who have legitimate medical grounds but those who oppose the vaccine as they don't support vaccines. I have zero tolerance for anti-vaxxers, and I've been dealing with them and a lot of those people for a lot longer than many others in this place. There's nothing like being the mother of a newly diagnosed son with autism to be told that I caused it. I gave it to him because I'd had him vaccinated. It's wrong, deceitful and incredibly upsetting. 
but these people have permeated autism groups for years, written articles and diverted more money away from autism research than anyone else. Also, we can debunk time and again the work of a struck-off and disgraced physician. I've spoken up against these people since coming to this place and have received the most vile abuse, including threats to myself and my family. These people are abhorrent, their views are ridiculous, and no weight should be given to them at all. We have such a high voluntary rate of vaccination. We should maintain the national plan to reopen, the easing of restrictions. We should have no mask mandates, no QR codes. We should have unrestricted quarantine-free travel across our country, and businesses should be able to operate in the way that they feel they are best able to do so. I want to see the end of COVID like so many other Australians. I want to be able to visit friends I grew up with in Adelaide and Perth. I want my son to see his godmother in Queensland and my daughter to see her godparents in Adelaide. We need to let the national plan continue to roll out. Time has expired. Senator Still John, remotely. Thank you, Acting President. Vaccines and vaccinations save lives. They are one of the most powerful tools in our public health toolkit to fight this virus and to protect our community. And as community leaders, we should be encouraging people to get vaccinated. We should be sharing information about the opportunities to do so. And we should be focused on holding the authorities to account, the governments, both state and federal, for creating those opportunities and incentives for people to get vaccinated. Now, the story of Australia's COVID times is a story dominated by the success of the community in coming together to act in community-minded ways to limit death and harm, transposed against the failure of the Morrison government. It is now conclusively known that our government had the opportunity, the Liberals had the opportunity, to order more vaccines earlier, and they didn't. The three key elements of a successful vaccine rollout, whether it be for COVID-19 or any other disease, are communication, coordination, and supply. Now, in each of these areas, the federal government, the national government, is the most important actor. They have the most levers to pull to get the work done, and yet the Liberal government failed. They failed disabled people, particularly actively deprioritizing us when the extent of their mismanagement became known. And they have failed time and time again to take the simple steps being modeled all around the world to get vaccines to people proactively and get them that protection. What we saw last week was a continuation of the Liberal failure in this space. Not content with failing to get the vaccines when we needed them, not content uh, with taking away the supports that people needed to follow the health advice and keep the case numbers down, the Morrison government last week failed its final test, the test of moral character, the test of how you respond when terrifying violence begins to spread in our community, when lies and deceit are spread by those in positions of power. The Prime Minister was given the opportunity to condemn the violent, hateful rhetoric, to call it out, and he failed to do it. He gave it safe harbour for the simple reason that he sees votes in it. He sees that it will Senator, be Senator Still John, I remind you that in proper political Senator Still John, order. 
I remind you that the imputation of improper motives is contrary to standing orders. I'd ask you to remind, recall that in your remarks. You have the call. It was quite clear that the Morrison government's political agenda in relation to reacting to that violence in our community was motivated solely by a belief that there is votes in it for them should they double speak to these people, to these movements. It is one of the most profound displays of political cowardice in the nearly 10 years of a government which has been dominated by moments of failure when it comes to moral questions, failures of leadership. In fact, should the biography of Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, ever be written, it would be rightly titled Failing Upwards, the Scott Morrison story. Now, at this moment, what is needed is honesty from community representatives, not a callous attempt to win votes on the eve of an election, which is what we are seeing from this government in its final desperate days. Senator Watt, remotely. You have the call. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, this motion that the Senate is debating today, you would think is pretty simple. Uh, we are not asking much of senators today with this motion. All this motion seeks to do is to call on all senators, regardless of their party, regardless of their state, uh, to share accurate information about the efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccines based on health advice, not based on Dr Google, Dr Facebook, Dr Clive Palmer, Dr Conspiracy Theorist, but based on health advice from recognised experts in the field, many of, of whom actually are employed by this federal government. This motion calls on all senators to combat the disinformation campaigns uh, that we are seeing from far too many quarters in our society and sadly from senators who are supposed to be elected to represent the best interests of all Australians, but who seem to be more preoccupied with spreading fear and disinformation about vaccines which stand our best chance of keeping our communities safe and keeping our economies working and keeping people in jobs. This motion calls on all senators to support government action, regardless of which level of government, regardless of which party, uh, that seeks to keep communities safe. And that government action includes vaccination mandates, which are imposed on the basis of health advice. This is, these mandates, just like other actions that have been taken by governments, state, federal and local, are based on health advice. They are not being done on a whim. They are not being done out of some power grab, as is being alleged. They are being done on the basis of health advice with the express purpose of keeping our communities safe, keeping people alive, keeping our economies going and keeping people in work. Uh, and it is important to note that these mandates have been imposed by all state and territory governments. We only hear from the Prime Minister and his colleagues about mandates that are imposed in Labor states. They are completely silent about the fact that these motions, uh, these mandates, have also been imposed by their Liberal and National Party colleagues in state and territory governments. It's as if a mandate imposed by a Labor state is a terrible thing and a mandate imposed by a Liberal or National state is a wonderful thing. That goes to the dishonesty that we are seeing from this Prime Minister and unfortunately so many of his colleagues as we all should be combining to combat COVID, to combat disinformation and to keep our communities safe. And this motion also supports comments that this Prime Minister has been made before. There's not many times that you'll see 
opposition senators giving this prime minister a pat on the back for doing the right thing around COVID. But from time to time, he has done the right thing, especially when he was speaking to Sydney Radio in August, commending the New South Wales government for bringing in vaccination mandates and for noting that businesses have a legitimate right to refuse patrons who are unvaccinated. In August, it was OK for the Prime Minister to back the New South Wales government and to back New South Wales businesses who exclude patrons on the basis of their vac vaccination status. But when it comes to Queensland or any Labor state, it's of course a different matter. This goes to the core of how this Prime Minister has approached this issue and every issue. He is constantly looking to pick fights with Labor states, with the residents of those states, while giving a free pass for exactly the same kind of behaviour that we see from Liberal state governments. What we need at the moment as we seek to recover from COVID-19 is a Prime Minister and a government who will actually bring the country together, who will not seek to divide the country on the basis of the colour of their politic of their state government. That's what we need and it's not what we're getting from this Prime Minister. Now, I'll be interested to see how this vote goes on this motion because we've heard a lot from a couple of senators, particularly uh, Senators Hanson and Senator Rennick, uh, who, are with, along, along with their colleagues over recent weeks, have been promising Australians who support their position on mandates that they won't support government legislation and they won't vote with the government over this fortnight. Well, here is another test for Senator Hanson and Senator Rennick to see whether they're actually, actually their word means anything. If their word means anything, they will continue to vote against the government Order. just like they Your promised to do. has expired. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy uh, President. Um, uh, this motion, this motion uh, uh, from, from the party that used to be called and known as the Labor Party shows completely that the Labor Party have completely deserted protecting workers' rights. They no longer give, a, give two hoots about the rights of workers to work, the rights of labourers to work. There is no longer a Labor Party. They should get it over with change their name to the woke party, get it done, because they are not representing labourers, they are not representing workers, they are not even representing unions. Because the Australian Council of Trade Unions, the ACTU, just a few months ago put out a joint statement with the Business Council opposing mandatory vaccinations, opposing them. It says here that, uh, that we believe—this is a direct quote from the, the Business Council and the Australian Council of Trade Unions—that we believe that for the overwhelming majority of Australians, your work or workplace should not fundamentally alter the voluntary nature of vaccination. I, I concur with that wholeheartedly. People in this country should have the right to work and provide for their families. Not according to the Labor Party. Not according to the Labor Party. The statement goes on to say, just so I'm clear, uh, and, and this also reflects my view, they say. The employers and unions recognise that for a small number of high-risk workplaces there be, may be a need for all workers in a workplace to be vaccinated to protect community health and safety. I believe that too, and that's why this morning I, I recognise that in my contribution. But to impose mandates across almost our whole economy, which is occurring in many states, and for all time, or potentially perpetuity, which is also something apparent in some states. That is a breach of a person's fundamental right to be able to work so that they can have and provide food on their table for their children. This is outrageous that state governments are doing this. This motion, though, is also totally incoherent. On the one hand, it says that businesses should have the right to refuse entry uh, to people who are unvaccinated. and On the other, it says, oh, we should mandate that anyway. Well, businesses don't have that right to choose, then. They don't have a right to choose if it's mandated for them by governments. So the Labor Party here are trying to have their cake and eat it too. They're holding out the hope that somehow businesses would have a choice, and they respect choice. But then at the same time, in this motion, they are taking away that choice by supporting mandates as well. Now, I notice that uh, Senator Watt there was saying that uh, mandated vaccine mandates should apply where the health advice says. So where is this health advice, by the way? We never seem to get to see it. Uh, it seems to be hidden uh, from all of us mere mortals. But 
but Senator Watt, what Senator Watt does not explain is how do we deal with a situation where health ex experts will disagree, and some of them do disagree. Uh, Dr Nick Coatesworth, who was, until uh, not that long ago, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer uh, of the Commonwealth Government, a highly respected expert in this field. Uh, he said just the other day, actually on, on the 18th of November, only late last week, he said, and I'm quoting, that one of the best decisions ever made by a jurisdiction was Adam Barr's determination to avoid that he's the Canberra First Minister, uh, and, uh, um, and, sorry, Andrew Barr's determination to avoid differential treatment of unvaccinated Canberrans, no vaccine passports, just convincing the community and facilitating vaccination. That's the way it's done. That's, that's pretty clear health advice. And the ACT is an example where there's been no vaccination passports, and I believe they have the highest vaccination rate in the country. They've done that without any mandating, without any for, forced uh, people to force to lose their jobs, at least in a widespread way. Again, keeping in mind that, yes, in high-risk health environments, that might be required. But they haven't required people to show their medical papers to go to a cafe. They haven't required uh, a retail worker, someone working at a supermarket, uh, to, to get a vaccination just to keep their job. And they've achieved the result we want, we all want, which is high vaccination rates. So where is the evidence that this works? I mean, this is a fundamental restriction on people's human rights. Surely we can agree with that. Surely someone does have a right to work. We recognise it in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, something that we hear a lot from the Labor and Greens Party about these international treaties we should comply with. Well, that's in there. It's in the heart of the document uh, that people have a right to work. So we're breaching that right. We are restricting that right. And to do so, if you're going to do so, you'd want to have pretty good evidence that this stuff works. But we have almost zero evidence that it works. It's certainly the vaccine passports policies are certainly not working overseas. And any other speakers in this debate will just challenge, challenge, challenge you. Provide an example where vaccine passports have worked. Just one, just one country. Just name one where they have worked. But look, even regard, I, I want to be clear that even, even if the health advice, which is not, but even if the health advice were all in one direction for vaccine passports, we cannot, we cannot give up our responsibility to make decisions on these fundamental issues just to people who are expert in one narrow field, because these issues go beyond much more than just the coronavirus or health issues alone. They go to fundamental human rights, and therefore we, it is incumbent on us not to outsource our decision making our responsibility to weigh up evidence and advice for the best interests of the Australian people, to protect their rights, to make sure we remain a free country. And I want to quote here from, from C.S. Lewis, who said this many years ago—I think it was in, yes, in 1958, many years ago, but it's quite prescient—where he said that the new oligarchy must more and more base its claim to plan us on its claim to knowledge. If we are to be mothered, mother knows best. This means they must increasingly rely on the advice of scientists till, in the end, the politicians proper become merely the scientists' puppets. But government involves questions about the good for man and justice, and what things are worth having at what price. And on these, a scientific training give, uh, gives a man's opinion no added value. Let the doctor tell me I shall die unless I do so and so. But whether life is worth having on those terms is no more a question for him than any other man. That is, a, that, is a, that is a succinct summary of what we used to consider freedom uh, in this country and right around Western civilisation. That it was up to the, each individual was sovereign to decide what was important in their lives. That it was not for a centralised government to dictate uh, what they should do on, with their life, with their lifestyle. With their, with their diet and certainly not uh, with medical procedures. But that is what we're doing here. That is what we're doing here. And the Australian people have worked this out. The Australian people have worked it out. That's why you see hundreds of thousands of people in the streets. And they're not all unvaccinated people. There are, there are plenty of people like myself who are vaccinated that will fight and protect the rights of other Australians to make a different decision. There are thousands of people who have never seen protests like this in this country, and they've been almost overwhelmingly peaceful protests, probably the most peaceful protests we've ever seen in this country. And now we have people wanting to silence fellow Australians. Uh, we have the Labor member for Keppel near where I, where I live uh, wanting to refer our local mayor 
uh, to, the, to the C in Queensland because he had the temerity to vote against the Queensland government's draconian vaccine mandate laws. This behaviour is rep reprehensible. Uh, to try and silence an elected official through threats, through threats of referral uh, uh, to what are otherwise should be corruption-making bodies, corruption-investigating bodies, uh, is a low point uh, for the member for Keppel there in central Queensland, and that's quite an achievement for her based on her uh, previous conduct. There were two, over 2,000 people in Yapoon on the weekend campaigning against these mandates. I know many of them. I, I, can, I can vouch for the fact that they're not. They're not far-right extremists. Uh, they're not radical extremists. They're not fringe elements, as the Queensland Deputy Premier tagged them last week. They are upstanding men and women in our community, many of them business owners, uh, many of them involved in voluntary organisations, who are just trying to defend the right of people to earn a living and not be forced to undertake a medical procedure. They do not deserve, they do not deserve their own member of parliament in Queensland seeking to bully and silence their mayor uh, from standing up for them. I applaud the work of the Capricorn uh, Coast, sorry, the Livingston Shire Council on the Capricorn Coast last week. They stood up as one and voted unanimously against these vaccine passports. And it's about time that the Queensland Labor government actually listened to the people of Queensland. It's about time they discussed these matters before running off dictates in Brisbane that tell us how we should live up there in central Queensland, uh, because I tell you what, uh, people up there do not want their freedoms taken away. They will not back down on this fight. They will continue to support all of our fellow central Queenslanders to make their own decisions, to work to provide for their family and ensure that we do not lose the free country we were all born in. Thank you. Senator Roberts, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Senator Wong's motion clarifies the voting choices on offer to the electorate at the next election. Senator Wong has made it clear that under an Albanese banned government, there will be no place for democracy. There will be no place for freedom of speech. There will be no place for independent thought. There will be no democracy under a government that the Labor Party leads. There will only be mindless conformity. The very nature of the Senate is to bring together representatives with different opinions based on different life experiences, education and origin. Such a debate will necessarily leverage opposing facts and opposing interpretations of facts, and through this process is more likely to arrive at the truth. Data and truth lead to sound, sustainable policy decisions. With this motion, Senator Wong is demonstrating why a Labor Greens government so seldom makes good policy decisions, as we saw in the last Labor Greens government. Echo chambers do not make for good government. One nation will defend our democracy and our right to free speech. We will continue to advocate debate on the issues of the day, including COVID injections. And we will continue to call out unelected bureaucrats with massive financial conflicts of interest. Australia is not a corporate dictatorship, no matter how hard Senator Wong and this parliament try to make it one. On the weekend, half a million Australians demonstrated what they think of Senator Wong's motion. Despite media censorship and suppression, half a million Australians came out to defend freedom of speech and freedom of choice. In a beautiful expression of unity across political, religious, professional and cultural backgrounds, Everyday Australians around the country demonstrated a love for one flag, one community and one nation. I've attended marches and rallies at Brisbane and the Gold Coast and will be doing so again this coming Saturday in support of the people and in support of freedom. I felt people's anger, their determination, their resentment, their sadness, their grief and I felt people's disdain for MPs and senators who ignore the people, who try to control the people. With this motion, Senator Wong is saying to the millions who demonstrated and to people who cheered them on from home, shut up and comply. What a clear picture of life under a Labor Greens government Labor has painted today. One nation will never shut up and comply. And we will support people who have the freedom to speak up and the courage and integrity to speak up. 
We compliment and appreciate the Livingston Council in central Queensland, the Capricorn Coast. What a wonderful example of courage and integrity and listening to and supporting and working for and serving the people in their latest uh, declaration motion that was passed unanimously last week. We applaud you. Thank you very much, Mayor and all councillors. In One Nation, we listen, we stand up and we speak up. We are representatives of the people. We work for the people. We serve the people. We will always support freedom and basic human rights. We have one flag. We are one community. We are one people. And we are one nation. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Billick, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As parliamentarians, the people of Australia, the voters, have put their trust in us. We hold positions of huge responsibility. We are community leaders with a voice, a platform and an audience. And as leaders, what we say in public carries a great deal of weight. In the COVID pandemic, compliance with public health restrictions is vital to making those restrictions work. Acceptance of the safety and efficacy of vaccines is vital to making the vaccine rollout work. But sadly, there are some in this place and in the House of Reps who have chosen to undermine the public health effort instead, to fearmonger and spread misinformation. Madam Acting President, parliamentarians have a hugely important role to play in reinforcing public health messages. The most powerful antidote we could have against the conspiracy theories and disinformation being peddled by some members and senators is the holder of Australia's highest office to reject their crazy ideas and suggestions. When Mr Kelly promotes unproven COVID treatments like ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, it's not good enough for Mr Morrison to simply say, he's not my doctor, or that Mr Kelly's pronouncements don't align with his views. When Senator Rennick goes about spreading vaccine conspiracy theories, it's not good enough for the Health Minister, Mr Hunt, to simply make a pathetic plea for him to stick with the facts. The dangerous ideas being promoted by these parliamentarians should be met with swift and clear condemnation by the Prime Minister, not some sort of timid disagreement. For some Australians, the spread of dangerous ideas which undermine our public health measures could literally be a matter of life or death. It must be condemned in the strongest possible terms, and the Prime Minister must send a clear message to Liberal members and senators engaging in this dangerous behaviour that it will not be tolerated in his party. And as if the disinformation isn't dangerous enough, we saw some senators in this place vote for a bill this morning which have undermined public health measures. The message Senator Hanson, Senator Roberts and five, five coalition senators are sending to Australians is that they reject the tools that are needed to keep the public safe. They're telling vulnerable Australians, such as aged care residents and hospital patients, that it's OK for them to bear the risk of being exposed to unvaccinated workers. While health experts and professionals are working hard to lift vaccination rates, Australians can get back to enjoying their freedoms. We've got government senators undermining that effort without any consequence. If Mr Morrison or Mr Joyce won't discipline their rogue senators, at the very least, at the very least, they should publicly rebuke them. But it's a little surprise that Mr Pop Morrison appears to lack the courage to confront his backbenchers when he himself is not fully committed to the public health measures necessary to get us safely through the pandemic. Regardless of whether you agreed with them or not, every Australian Prime Minister up until now has had clear convictions and a clear vision for the nation. But I've never seen a national leader so lacking in conviction or vision as Mr Morrison. And the COVID pandemic has shown us all his true colours. 
This is a Prime Minister who has talked up the measures that have kept Australia safe from COVID, but keeps giving a nod and a wink to the radical fringe that rails against these measures. He made a statement condemning expressions of violence by protesters, then said he sympathised with their frustrations. That's doublespeak. It's rubbish. He needs to be strong. He took credit for the actions of states and territories in stopping the spread of COVID, but he fought them every step of the way and then pressured them, especially the Labor states, to lift restrictions. And his government even joined a High Court challenge by mining magnate Clive Palmer against Western Australia's border restrictions before public pressure forced them to withdraw. The Prime Minister talks up the importance of getting vaccinated but refuses to reprimand those in his own party who undermine vaccination messages. This is a Prime Minister who is quite happy to appeal to mainstream Australia, all the while quietly courting the preferences you, of Senator one, Billy, nation, time has one nation and the past. Senator Davey. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Look, I agree with the calls for us all to share accurate information about the efficacy of COVID vaccines. I would also say that it is commensurate on all of us to share accurate information about jurisdictional reach and to share accurate information about what we can do unilaterally as a federal government and what we can't, who is responsible for what. And let's also consider and be accurate about what people are currently protesting against, because yes, facts matter. For those who are currently protesting against restrictions, and that is what they're protesting against, they're not protesting against vaccine mandates because there are no vaccine mandates. They are protesting against restrictions based on vaccination status and differential treatment of those who are or who are not fully vaccinated. Those restrictions have been put in place by the state and territory governments. These are state and territory decisions under state and territory laws. They are following their public health orders. It is not the Commonwealth Government's place to be able to usurp those. So, The bill that we saw this morning that many people have referred to in this afternoon's debate was designed to try and usurp state rights. Now, that's a very slippery slope to start going down. Where do we stop? But that bill this morning, a bill that was supposedly to stop government overreach, was government overreach writ large. Our government's position has and always will be that COVID-19 vaccination should be voluntary except in highly exceptional circumstances such as people who work in health and aged care. Senator Lambie said it very well this morning, and for anyone who didn't listen, I encourage you to go and listen to her Hansard, because she explained that vaccination is a choice, and in certain industries, the choice is you get a vaccination or find another calling. Now, that is not new. Certain employment arrangements have had vaccination requirements for decades. In New South Wales, you haven't been able to be a nurse without being vaccinated against whooping cough. In many aged care facilities, it's been mandatory to get a flu shot, not just once, but annually. The issue we are currently seeing is not really about those accepted norms for vaccine requirements in exceptional circumstances, but it is being driven by fear. And when I looked deeper into Senator Hansen's bill this morning, it caused me fear because that bill also it didn't just prohibit governments from mandating vaccines for their own workers. It prevented the Commonwealth, state or territory governments from entering into an agreement, providing funding, or granting a licence to a permanent or entity, be it government or private, or a charity or an NGO, an entity that is reasonably likely to discriminate on the basis of COVID vaccination. And that reasonably likely test is, have they put in restrictions in the past? Are you serious? That bill would have seen organisations such as St John's Ambulance, 
who are a fantastic organisation that provide excellent first aid support and community programs. They would have been restricted, prevented from receiving funding or contracting to a state government. Our charities would have been impacted. You know, sorry, Red Cross, next time there's a black summer bushfire, you can't have any money because you might require your first aid instructors who teach things like resuscitation to actually be vaccinated against something like the COVID-19 uh, virus. Salvation Army and St Vincent de Paul, who work with the homeless and vulnerable, would have been prohibited from receiving grants or funding if they ask their volunteers, who work with the most vulnerable people in our society, to vaccinate to protect them. And private hospitals. Well, sorry, St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney, part of the St Vincent Health Australia, but who provide full-service public teaching hospital? Not anymore under Senator Hanson's bill. So yes, facts matter. And the fact of the matter is that our government believes in voluntary vaccination, but the states are, are applying restrictions, you, but also— Thank you. Senator Grogan. I rise to speak in support of this urgency motion because I simply cannot fathom what members of the Morrison-Joyce government are seemingly greenlit to parade around the country undermining public health advice in the middle of a deadly pandemic. Last Sunday, just two days before South Australians in a nervous fashion are due to throw open our doors to the nation, we had a member of this chamber addressing the Adelaide anti-vax rally. What parallel universe are we in when someone elected to represent the people of South Australia and all the inherent responsibilities that that entails that have been borne out through this debate today? is addressing a rally conceived to undermine a public health message and a public health response to a deadly disease that has killed five million people worldwide. Should Alex, Senator Antic and other coalition members spreading this misinformation about the virus be reined in? Of course they should. But will they be? I can't see it. I can't see the Prime Minister or the Deputy Prime Minister doing anything about this. They are allowing senators from this chamber to spread misinformation, to support anti-science, anti-vax rallies like the one we saw in Adelaide on the weekend. It suits the government to have a bob each way, partly supporting people who believe in science, partly supporting people who don't. The conspiracy theorists and the right-wing nutjobs and the social media medics are out there pushing this line, and it's being supported by members of this chamber. It suits the Prime Minister to have those on the far right of his party out there talking to the fringe, while keeping his own hands clean so he can gather their preferences whenever the next election is held. We see this sort of doublespeak quite a lot with the Prime Minister and his government, and in normal circumstances, it's annoying, it's pathetic, it's always disappointing. But when we're dealing with a deadly pandemic, one that threatens the lives of vulnerable people and those immunodeficient, immune it is reckless beyond belief, and it lacks the leadership that we should demand in this country. On the very same day, we had coalition MPs and senators addressing anti-vax rallies around this country, we learned that a young Victorian child under 10 was killed by this disease. To protect our community, we all have to do our part. The nation, including my home state of South Australia, is screaming out for leadership. And what do they get? Well, from Senator Antic, they get a tacit nod to misinformation and to anti-science, reactionary right-wing politics. As I said earlier, it suits the Prime Minister's interests to have a bob each way on a serious issue of public health. From the get-go, the government's response to the pandemic has been marked by mixed messages, indecision and blatant misinformation. Instead of unequivocally calling out the disgusting threats to the Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews at anti-vax rallies in Melbourne in recent times, the Prime Minister has said he understands their concerns. 
instead of urging those who are holding out on getting vaccinated to not be influenced by the hateful campaigns from the anti-vaxxers, he says they understand, he understands their concerns. Well, their concerns have no basis in scientific fact, and their concerns are being driven through our communities and are discouraging people from getting vaccinated, which then places their community at risk. Time and time again, this government has failed to call out the misinformation and extreme elements from within our community, because doing so might lose them a few of Pauline Hanson or Clive Palmer's preferences. Australians are not stupid. They are awake to the doublespeak, to the dog whistling and to the government that cares little for anything but its own sorry political survival. We must ensure that we provide accurate health advice and fight against disinformation campaigns and protect our communities. This is a deadly disease. Herd immunity is a useful tool in fighting these diseases. It helps us protect those who cannot be vaccinated for medical reasons and helps us keep our communities safe. Thank you. Thank you. So the question is that the matter of urgency moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Thank you.